Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Mercer, and I'm so glad that you have chosen to worship with us here in the bridge, Asbury's expression of modern worship. If you're worshiping online with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you as well. For those of you who are guests, we are so honored that you are joining us today. Uh, we have a gift for you at the Welcome Center in the very uh, back in the, in the hallway, and we would love to give you that at the end of the service. Also want to reiterate what Amy said about Asbury Now. If you're looking uh, to know how to be more engaged here at uh, Asbury, we invite you to Asbury Engage. It's November the 7th. It's right after church, there'll be a light lunch, and then we will talk about how we can worship, serve, and grow together in Christ. Now, if you've been thinking about formally becoming a part of our church family through church membership, that's the place to go so we can walk you through that process. Now, we say all the time that everyone has something to bring, so let's give Jesus our best. I hope that you got a connection card as you came into the room today. If not, they're right there in the very back. You can pick one up. This is how we stay connected. Now, on the front, you'll find lots of information about our church. This little QR code will take you right to places where you can find the details of everything happening. You can sign up for Asbury Engage right there just by using that QR code. And on the bottom, we would love to know that you are here. Now this is for everyone. Uh, fill out the bottom and there's a basket in the back at the end of the service. You can drop it there or you can just leave it in your chair. And if you flip it over, you can do some sermon notes as well as leave us a prayer request. We would love to know that you're worshiping with us today. You know, someone told me not too long ago, they said, uh, they know that things will be getting a little bit better when uh, donuts are back at the bridge. <laughs> now, this was someone who I think uh, worships down the hallway most of the time. And they were like, gosh, we can't wait for those donuts to get back. Well, we got some great news. Next Sunday, we'll have coffee and donuts back here in the bridge. And we are <laughs> excited to add that to our... Um, uh, community again. And um, I think that Josh is as excited as anyone, but did not, you're new to us since we haven't had them. Yeah, and so we're, we're excited to, to, for you to experience the bridge. Yeah, he's all college students, right? Always hungry. Here at the bridge, we open in prayer. I invite you to uh, hold your hands out, palms up, just an expression to say, I'm going to give Jesus my very best this morning. Oh God, we thank you for this morning, this time to come and to worship together. Oh God, may you hear our praises, may you know our hearts, and may we forever strive to be the people you've created us to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together and online. Let's turn the music up. Let's worship.
there's nothing worth more that will ever come close nothing can compare you're our living hope your presence lord i've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is
scripture reading from today for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapters 12, verses 38 through 44. As he was teaching, he said, watch out for the legal experts. They like to walk around in long robes. They want to be greeted with honor in the markets. They long for places of honor in the synagogues and at banquets. They are the ones who cheat widows out of their homes. And to show off, they say long prayers. They will be judged most harshly. Jesus sat across from the collection box for the temple treasury and observed how the crowd gave their money. Many rich people were throwing in lots of money. One poor widow came forward and put in two small copper coins worth a penny. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than everyone who's been putting in money in the treasury. All of them are giving out of their spare change. But she, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything she had, even what she needed to live on. Oh God, add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and, script, and, and understanding of the scripture. Our hearts and minds are open. Amen. Here in the bridge, children are always welcome to stay for worship. But our children's ministry has children's church just down the hall. If your child is a kindergartner through second grader, please have them meet me in the back of the room and we'll go to room 214 where you can pick them up. A sermon series called The Bridge here at The Bridge. And uh, have you ever wondered why we call this service The Bridge? Well, one of the things that, that we know we're doing as Christian people is we're continually striving to be the person that God has created us to be. And in Methodism circles, we have a long history of, uh, of that. We, we call it moving on to perfection. Now that sounds really daunting and that's kind of 1700s language. So we're gonna pack that out, pack, unpack that a little bit to help us understand what that means for us today. Now, every Sunday we say that everyone has something to bring, so let's give Jesus our best. And last week, Pastor Maggie was here, and, and she talked to us about how everyone has value. Uh, have you ever received a gift and thought to yourself, how much effort went into this? You know, sometimes we receive gifts, and then we re-gift them, right? <laughs> you know, this is such a common thing that News & World Reports actually put out an article for the etiquette of regifting, and and one of the things it said was, "Don't regift a family." <laughs> that, that's pretty smart. And, and when you do regift, make sure that the package is really, really pretty. <laughs> you know, sometimes we receive things that we just don't want or need or have a use for, and we gladly will regift that and give it away. You know. We do this in our relationship with God as well. Sometimes we give God what is left, the leftovers, instead of giving God our best. You know, giving our best means that, that we give the good stuff, not just the spare change, like our scripture says. Uh, and in this scripture, that Angie read from the, the book of Mark, uh, Jesus and the scribes are always at each other in the book of Mark. Uh, they, they are adversaries in a lot of ways. Not all the scribes, but, but many of them. You know, people 
we're beginning to realize that Jesus' teachings had authority. And this kind of challenged the scribes because they realized that they didn't have the same kind of authority in the way they were teaching. So it kind of left conflict between them and Jesus. And after Jesus had been teaching a long time, he, he sat down near the place that they were taking up the offering, probably to rest a little bit. He looked up and he saw people putting money into the treasury. He saw the wealthy putting in lots of money, making these showy gifts. And, and sometimes they would just take lots of change and just dump it into the treasury. And of course it would make this grand noise and the more you would give, the more noise it would make. Uh, in my brain, I think of, of uh, someone winning the jackpot at the casino. You know, you just hear all that click, 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 click. And these people were, were making a spectacle of themselves as they gave their gifts. And then something caught Jesus' attention. Just two small clicks. Click, click. Two copper coins, about a penny in value. And then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, the truth is, is that this poor widow gave more to the collection than all the others put together. All the others gave what they'll never miss. She gave it extravagantly, what she couldn't afford. She gave it all. She gave her best. Now, it's important for us to remember what a widow's status was in that society. Widows in this time and place were heavily dependent on their husband, well, women, not just widows, but women were heavily dependent on their husbands and their families in order to survive. And so when you lose that and become a widow, you become one of the most marginalized people in the society. And many times we read this text and we've heard it preached as a commendation on how we should give as people. And certainly it's that. However, it's a condemnation on how the rich, wealthy folks were giving to God. I want us to look at this verse. Let's, let's put it up there on the screen. This is verse 40. They're talk, Jesus is talking about the scribes. He says, they are the ones who cheat the widows out of their homes. And to show off, they say long prayers. They will be judged most harshly. You know, we don't know exactly what Jesus is saying when he says that the scribes cheat the widows out of their homes. Maybe they weren't allocating resources enough for them to be able to sustain life. Uh, maybe it was the fact that some were expecting the widows to give to the treasury. Most people in that day wouldn't. Most people in that day would understand that the widow should keep all that she has because of her marginalization in the society. You know, maybe she gave all that she had her whole life to the treasury because she trusts God. And that even in the midst of a broken system, that God would be faithful if she gave Jesus her best. You see, God doesn't measure the size of your devotion by what you give. That wouldn't tell the real truth of the heart of your life. No, God looks at what you keep back for yourself as the barometer 
of your trust in him and how you follow him. Giving our best means that we give the good stuff, not the leftovers, not the spare change. You know, just like the scribes in the text, there are many things that, that, that keep us from, from giving our best to God. I think one of the biggest problems that we have is the way in which we view the world, the lens in which we look at what's going on around us is one of the biggest things that keeps us from giving our best. You know, this week some interesting news has come out about social media. Uh, we're learning that, that social media drives our algorithms to push stories that bring out the worst fears and anxieties in us. Now, they don't do this because they're evil people. They do it because it enhances their engagements and it drives up their profits. Let's think about that for just a moment. People are more likely to engage in hate and negativity than they are in love and positivity. When we look at our news and our social media feeds, we think that everything is horrible, that everything is bad, the murder rate's up, <laughs> inflation is, is driving prices where people can't afford stuff, the pandemic has caused havoc amongst all kinds of industries. We believe that everything in the world is bad. Okay, don't believe me that we think the worst of things. How about this? Just think of your favorite college football team and the rivalry. When you, when you watch that other school play somebody else, don't you feel a little good when they lose? <laughs> yeah, we all do. It happens. We know who you are. As people of faith, it shouldn't surprise us that it's this way because we know that we're all broken in some way. And from the beginning of times, we humans have failed to bridge that gap between how we really live our life and how we need to be living our life. Uh, Paul in Romans uh, uh, says this, uh, what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another doing the things I absolutely despise. Do you resonate with that? I know I sure do. However, viewing the world through a lens of negativity instead of a positive one keeps us from giving Jesus our best. I believe that God is at work in the world and I believe that there are more positive things happening in the world than negative things. And when we view the world through a negative lens, that's when we hold back instead of give out of our abundance. And the truth is, we can change the way we look at the world. We don't have to look at the world through a negative lens. You know, here at our church, in this service, we talk a lot about bridging the gap. The gap between who we currently are and who God wants us to be. We understand that when you become a follower of Jesus, that you don't automatically become this perfect Christian human being. Because we know that we're all broken. And it's unrealistic to think that, that we're going to get from how we really live to where God wants us to live in an instant. So we like, like to talk about those 1% changes that we can make in our lives to get us closer to where God wants us to be. That's what Bridge the Gap is all about. And so using the word best as an acrostic, we're gonna look at four things that we can do this week to help us bridge the gap 
and give Jesus our best. B, first of all, you need to be yourself. You know, identity is something that, that is just a hot topic in, in our culture today. We're all wrapped up in trying to figure out who we are. Uh, companies spend millions of dollars on personality tests to figure out who works this way and who works that way and what our strengths are. Now, those are all good and wonderful things. Don't hear me saying that we shouldn't do that. But it fails to understand that we are made in the image of God. I've had the privilege of working with confirmation students here at Asbury for the last nine years. And from time to time, we'll, we'll have a lesson where we have the students, and we haven't done it for a few years, but we'll have the students take an index card and they will write down a question they have for God. We'll tell them, pretend you can ask God anything, write it down, we'll pick them up and we'll sort through them and we'll do our best to answer them. I keep this... When I had a bulletin board in my office, I, I kept it on my bulletin board. Um, but I, now it just kind of sits on my desk in a little envelope holder. And, and I've kept this. This is, what, what are seniors? This is eight years old, nine years old. Right, maybe for, towards the beginning of my time here. Uh, this person's a senior. I don't know who it is, but I remember it came from that class. And it's a young lady. And she says, she's talking to God. Remember, the, the question is, if you could ask God anything, what would it be? And she says, you say you've been through everything. And she capitalized everything and underlined it. You say you've been through everything. But have you ever been a sixth grade girl struggling through middle school? You hear that? Struggling with identity. Struggling with who you are. We need to spend more time and energy searching for who Jesus is calling us to be. Our identity as male or female, uh, popular or unpopular, Alabama or Auburn, uh, Democrat or Republican, gay or straight, we are more than those things. We are more than the worldly labels that we put on ourselves. None of those identities compare to our identity in Christ. In Galatians, it says, there's neither Greek nor Jew, there's neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I think way too often, we look at our faith through that worldly lens of identities rather than picking up and looking at the world through the lens of our faith. For us to give our best to Jesus, we need, you need to be yourself. That's the person God has already created you to be. For us to bridge the gap and give Jesus our best, you need to be yourself and you need to expect some pushback. You know, when you, when you really give Jesus your best, you can expect other people not to understand why you're doing the things that you are doing. Because when you put a world lens on giving your best to Jesus, it doesn't make sense. Uh, back in August, I don't know if you remember, we, we did a series called The Art of Neighboring, and it was based on a book by uh, Jay Pathak and Dave Run Runyon. And these are two pastors who them and their families became convinced that Jesus had called them to live out the great commandment in being a neighbor to the people who lived right where they are, their actual physical neighbors. And, and they tell a story in the book about one of their kids who, 
who plays baseball, and he was really good at baseball. And they had to make a decision. And, and what they decided to do ultimately was have their kid play in rec league ball instead of travel ball, which, folks, you know if your kids are in this world, it almost cut the amount of games they would play in half, if not more. Now, their parents and their, their, their friends were like, what are you doing? This, you're robbing your son of an amazing opportunity to be competitive and to learn and to grow. We all know who plays sports or dance or music, that, that the only way to get better is to do it more and more and more. And they finally decided, if we're going to be serious about God calling us to love our neighbors right where we are, we can't be a family who's never home. It didn't make sense. They got all kinds of pushback. I bet the widow in our passage got pushback from the people in her world who said, why in the world would you give everything, even what you needed to live, Giving out of our leftovers is normal. But when you sacrifice and you give your best, people are going to think you've lost your mind. For us to bridge the gap and give Jesus our best, we need to, you need to be yourself, you need to expect some pushback, and you need to stay connected. You know, during this pandemic season, it's been really hard to stay connected to a group of people that, that you resonate with on a spiritual level. And the thing is, is we're not meant to walk this life alone. We're meant to walk it in community with each other. Uh, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, called this Christian conferencing. Uh, Wesley said that we should study the scriptures together, that we should pray together, that we should participate in the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion together. Now, you may think I'm just talking about church attendance here, but I'm, I'm really not. What I'm talking about is finding that group of people that you connect with in a way that pushes you closer to who God's calling you to be. That group of people that encourages you even when they don't agree with you. Now, church is a great place to find that community. But I'm not up here preaching this to make sure people stay in the church. I'm preaching it because it's the way we give Jesus our best is to stay connected. For us to bridge the gap and give Jesus our best, you need to be yourself, you need to expect pushback, you need to stay connected, and you need to trust God. You know, when the widow gave everything, she had to have had incredible trust in God to take care of her needs. The hard truth for most of us is that we're more like the scribes. Uh, we not only hold back what we're giving to Jesus, sometimes we leverage our stuff to get more stuff. What places are you not giving your best to Jesus? Is it with your money, your time, your talents? your service, or your witness. <laughs> Does any of that sound familiar? That's the part of the vows of church membership for the United Methodist Church. And all of these things can be overwhelming when we begin to look at where we actually are and where we, we should be. But remember, <laughs> the good news about bridging the gap is not to build the bridge in one day, it's to make a 1% change over time and then make another 1% change and then make another 1% change. And over time, 
you're getting closer and closer to the person God has created you to be. And God can use that 1% to do something really, really awesome. Uh, Hattie Mae Wyatt was a little girl who lived in Philadelphia in the late 19th century. She died and left her life savings to Grace Baptist Church. Her life savings in order to help build an education building for children's Sunday school. She left 57 cents. When the church learned about this gift, they began to give toward her vision. And they began to raise so much money that they bought property and it became Temple College, which became Temple University, which became and led to the building of Temple University Hospital. Just like what the widow gave, we can never measure the possible effectiveness of our gifts when God uses it to do something incredible. It doesn't matter how small of a difference you might think what you're giving matters. When it's with Jesus, and with other fellow believers, we can do something miraculous. Let's pray together. Oh God, we come to you this morning thankful for being able to be in this place, being able to worship together, being able, able to learn, to grow and to serve together in your name. Oh God, I pray that we all will covenant together this day to make that 1% change in our lives so that we can learn and grow and give our very best to you. Oh God, we pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to say as we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the place in our service where we worship through our giving, I invite you, there is a box in the back of the room. You can leave your, uh, your gifts there. Uh, you can also give online as well. Uh, I want to share a little story with you before we worship together. We just completed our Christmas shoebox project that we've done I think for the last five or six years now with Pray Love Unites Bulgaria ministry. And this is where we uh, pick names. You can pick a name and you can do a shoe box and you can send it and that kid gets that box. Um, this organization is near to my heart because full disclosure, one of my best friends and his wife started it, Ben and Cassidy Nelson. Uh, they started it on their own as they felt led by, by, by Jesus. And, and for nine years, they've given almost 3,000 shoeboxes to these uh, impoverished gypsy villages in Bulgaria. Due to the pandemic, um, they're about 1,200 boxes short this year. And uh, we were trying to figure out how we could fill these boxes and we went to our mission and action team. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Asbury, a long time ago, with our founding pastor, Mitchell Williams, Williams Chapel, uh, put into the DNA of the church that 10% of everything we take in, a tithe, will go out in mission and service. So whatever you give, 
10% goes to that mission and action. Another 10% goes to United Methodist stuff. So 20% of what Asbury brings in goes directly out. Mission and action, committed to taking those 1,200 boxes and wrote them a check for $10,500. And I just want to give praise to God for that. And uh, uh, Ben's mother-in-law, uh, Peggy, when, when he told her, she said, I'm literally crying. When we don't know how we'll do it, God just shows up. And God showed up. Because we gave Jesus our best. I couldn't have done that on my own. But through our church together, we can affect lives in a wonderful way. Let's stand. Let's sing together as we close our worship. I could just say I could just sit and wait for all your goodness Hope to feel your presence I could just stay I could just stay right where I am And hope to feel you Hope to feel something again Safe, oh, I could be safe here in your arms and never 
the people of God, go from this place without any shame, timidity, or fear to give Jesus your very best. Have a great week. Bye-bye.